The sun has left and forgotten me. It's dark, I cannot. Your stories don't define you, but how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief storymaker at Elkins Consulting. A quick reminder for listeners who are interviewing for jobs right now our course, Get Hired Job Interview Storytelling, is available for $199. It includes the online course and a group storytelling practice session. So if you're ready to nail your next interview, check out elkinsconsulting.com for more information. I am super excited to introduce my guest today, Cindy Burnett. We met through Caroline Brookfield, who is an outstanding author, comedian. Her book, The Reluctant Creative, is really outstanding. So in case you're curious about that book, go ahead, go to Amazon, pick it up, and tell Caroline Brookfield that Sarah Elkins sent you. Cindy, thank you so much for joining me on Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. How Thanks for are having you? me. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. Well, I'm I'm excited to get started because if Caroline thinks you're funny, I know you're funny. Oh, funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's all about creativity. And that was what her post was that named both of us. It was about mm. people who are creative in different ways and do different things with their natural creativity. So let's start with the question that I love to ask my guests, which is, um, I would love for you to share something with us about you that most people don't know. What do you think? Well, when I was younger, I used to drive in the back of my parents' car. I'm the youngest of five children. And I used to choreograph dances to every song I heard. And I've done that since I was little and I still do it today. So whenever I hear music, I'm dancing in my head. And I once thought when I saw the movie on um, the new Muppets, one of the new Muppet movies, and he said, there's a song in it called, Are You a Man or a Muppet? And I thought this song really speaks to me because I feel a little bit more Muppet than man sometimes because I've just, <laughs> I've always got musical numbers going on in my head. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. <laughs> that is hilarious. And they're, they're dancing. Like you're not doing the music itself. You're dancing to it. I'm singing and dancing. Singing and dancing. Yes. Oh my gosh. So yes. you are like my sister from another mister. Excellent. My whole family, uh, there are three of us, I'm the middle and all three of us are in performing arts. Mm -hmm. We we're all vocalists. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister was the biggest ham. She's the baby. Uh -huh. like you. Yep. And anyone could ask her, my mom would say, Karen, sing something for our, our friends that are here for dinner. And she would just burst into song. No problem. I'd be hiding, totally humiliated. <laughs> and yet now I sing in two bands professionally Wow. and I don't hesitate to get out there on stage anymore, but it took me into my forties to get that comfortable with it. Wow. So I love that you still do this. And the other thing that popped into my head is that my husband is also a musician. He plays in the mm -hmm. bands with me. He plays guitar. And there are so many times where we'll come to the dinner table or, you know, time for breakfast or whatever. And I look at him and I know there's a song in his head. Mm. He's not making any noise. He's not moving like dancing or anything. Mm -hmm. There's something about his demeanor that I'm like, okay, what's the song that's in your head right now? What's what earworm are you trying to deal with? Yes. <laughs> so, yes. I had this total image of you being a Muppet, like having this in your head and constantly kind of moving and dancing. I, thank you for sharing that. Yes. And I think, you know, it's interesting because people often say about musicals and my first career was in musical theater, um, but people often say about musicals, oh, you know, in what world do people just bust out into song and dance? And I'm like, in my world, in my world, they do that. <laughs> Because um, I'm very fortunate to be married to a husband who is equally as quirky. And so yesterday my daughter said something and we, my husband and I just busted out into the same song. And my daughter said, I feel like I can't say anything without it turning into a full-blown Broadway musical. And we said, <laughs> Broadway musical, let's go. You know, like everything just turns into <laughs> musicals. I love it. Oh my gosh. I'm sitting here grinning. I love it. <laughs> Uh, and I, I didn't know that about you, of course. I'm guessing that people aren't necessarily surprised when they hear that, even if they didn't know that about you. 
I sometimes I have to tame it down because of the audience that I have. You know, I mm-hmm. I work in the scientific field of creativity now, so I'm t- teaching more about the cognition and the affect around creativity and not the expressive side of creativity. So sometimes, and I remember I, I just recently worked with the National Guard. I said, I'm going to try not to dance, like bust down to, you know, my tap dancing for all of you. And they're like, oh, no, it's fine. You can do that. We're OK with it. I'm like, OK, <laughs> because sometimes, you know, you feel like especially in corporate environments or, you know, more rigid environments, you feel like you can't do those sorts of things because people will just think, well, you're a bit um, eccentric. And I always have to be careful of being right. eccentric and creative because that's a myth that you have to be eccentric in order to be creative. And that's not the truth. But I do have a little bit of um, oh, that flair yeah. in, internally that I sometimes have to manage. You know, I, I love that for so many reasons. The first is that people are always like, don't tamp down who you are. You know, you are who you are. Be yourself, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And you're right that there are times where you have to turn the dial down a little bit. You don't mm-hmm. turn it off. You don't turn it below a five because then you're not bringing your whole self. Right. But in order to make sure that your audience can relate to you so yes. that it's meaningful what you're saying, yes. sometimes you have to do things a little differently than you would. Yes. And I think context is so important. You know, I have a podcast called the Feeling Creativity and Education Podcast, and we interview some of the leading researchers and teachers and practitioners in the field of creativity. And that's where I met Caroline actually, because she came on the show. And one of the things that keeps coming up is context is like, just because you can do something in one context, doesn't mean you can do it in another. So even when, when I work in creativity in schools, you know, if I go to one school, something might work, but it might not work for a different context. And we always have to be aware of the environment that we're in, because if we are who we are, which we want to be our authentic selves. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Authenticity is one of my top three uh, core values as a human being is authenticity. But at the same time, I want, and at the same time, I want to make sure that my audience can connect with me and relate to me. So if I need to not tap dance for a group, that's okay. You know, because I want to get my point across and my point isn't, I have to be, you know, Mm -hmm. a performer and show them all my latest dance moves, but it's to get information across. (laughs) Then that's what my goal will be. Right. So there's absolutely a balance to that. Yeah. That makes so much sense. One of the things that I think about a lot is also creativity in context. Mm -hmm. So um, what I was fascinated by, among other things in Caroline's book, was the two different kinds of creativity that she describes, which is the kind within um, boundaries and 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 like within the box, and then the the creativity that has no constraints. Mm-hmm. And what I notice is that in most cases, I'm more creative without constraints, and my husband is far more creative with constraints. Hmm. So what you're referring to is actually a cognitive style based Mm -hmm. um, on Curtin, um, based on Michael Curtin, and he has a a continuum called adapters and innovators. And so if you think about this continuum, adapters like to work within the frame and innovators like Mm -hmm. to work outside the frame. So I'll never forget, I was teaching my students the K, it's called the KI theory. And if you look it up, you can take an assessment on it and you can get certified in it. But um, we were, I was teaching this met, this theory to my graduate students and uh, my, my kids came out with these t-shirts and it was these dinosaurs, you know, drawn in and they were supposed to color the dinosaur t-shirt. And my daughter colored perfectly inside the lines and my son didn't use anything within the lines. He turned it into something totally different. And I said, that's, that is a beautiful example of adapter innovator theory, because, you know, the way in which we work and feel comfortable is really important to know. And on his continuum and in his theory, you have to be within 10 points of someone to really be able to relate to someone. So it might be challenging for you and your husband to relate to each other sometimes because he's going off in big picture, abstract terms where you're more in the concrete um, inside making small changes. And that's where you're comfortable. Innovators, people on the innovative side. The opposite. 
they, yeah. oh, the opposite, sorry. So that, so you must have the opposite, uh, yeah, but I hear lots you. of, lots of big visions and think abstractly and need a lot of change and like change. Um, and so that can be a challenge within, you know, working relationships within, um, romantic relationship friendships, because you just, it's harder to understand one another when you're on the different sides of the continuum. Yes. So when you think about your relationships with people that are obvious, well, which one are you? First I'm very all, high on the innovative are you on side as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And entrepreneurial, right? Yes. Okay. And yes. I find that most people who are like really entrepreneurial have a tendency to be in that, on that side of things outside of the constraints, mm-hmm. um, especially entrepreneurial self-employed people versus startup founders, which yes. I find aren't necessarily as easy to identify. Mm-hmm. But when you think about um, that relationship, I, I mean, I think about sometimes when you say, you know, my husband is really good at adapting something that already exists and mm-hmm. thinking about how it can be used in different ways. I'm like starting from scratch going, right. well, we can create this. And it's like right. out of the ether for him. Mm-hmm. Luckily, we've been together a long time and we have gained an understanding of where our strengths are. So if I have constraints, I'll go to him mm-hmm. to, to help me with ideas about how to work within them. So what was a situation where you had that experience like with a client? With a client, I have to be very careful. And I will tell you that I deliberately team up with people who I know have more adaptive preferences than I do because they're going to pay attention to the details where I might miss them. So if I'm working on a book project, um, I'd like to work with people who are in different styles because diverse it's all about diversity and and all different kinds of mm-hmm. diversity, but diversity in cognitive style is a thing. And you know, you have to find those people who are not always like you because the worst thing you can do, you know, if you are running your own company and you hire, look around and everyone's like you, you're in trouble. And I'm not talking about like everyone looks like you, which is also trouble. But if everyone, you know, acts like you and thinks like you in terms of your creativity, if everyone's, you know, very high in the innovative side, you're not going to get anything done. You're you're just not. Because someone's got to work on those details. Someone's got to say, we're missing this, you know, cross on the T and we're not going to get the the grant that we went for. So I think you have to be very, very cautious when you understand cognitive style, where you should put your energy. Mm-hmm. So can you, do you, I, in, in a way, what I'd love for you to tell us is tell us what you do without telling us what you do by telling a story about a recent success with a client. So uh, I recently worked with the National Guard, which I mentioned, and when the National Guard contacted me, again, I thought, I'm a Muppet. This is the National Guard. Are they really Are they really looking for me? And they said, we've heard you do this thing. So I'm not supposed to say what it is, but we heard you, you know, you do this thing. Would you come and give us some professional development? And I said, I'm not exactly sure I'm the right person for you, which is what I tell everyone when I first meet with them. I always tell people when I meet with them, I will see if we're a good fit together. And if we're not a good fit, then I'm going to find you the right fit. Because one of the benefits of being in a small field like creativity is I know everybody, I know a lot of people. I know probably by by connection, I know probably 80% of the field people in my field because it's not very big. And mm-hmm. so if I if I'm not the right person, I want to help you find the right person. So my contact over there who is amazing, she said, "All right, we're looking to make our curriculum and our content and our lessons more creative." And I said, "Okay, do you want to learn you want you want someone to teach you about creativity or you want to integrate it?" And she said, "I want I want to integrate it into what we're doing." And I said, all right, I've written several books on that. I guess that is me. So I said, I think it might be a fit. So (laughs) so we started having more conversations around what that looked like. And what we started doing is looking at the lessons that are designed by the National Guard. Um, And this is in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we started looking at, could we integrate creative thinking skills? I use a set of 20 creative thinking skills into the content that they're teaching. So that's what we did. And so we've done uh, three levels of training with them and they're now successfully integrating creative thinking skills into their content. So 
I was pleasantly surprised at how um how wonderful of a fit it was because again, like I said, I, I get sort of intimidated when I'm working with people that are really, really different than I am. And I was com- I was pleasantly surprised at how wonderful they were, not only to work with, um, but open-minded and curious and playful. And that's exactly what I'm looking for when I'm looking to work with a client is to find those people who are really open-minded and say, I want better. I want to improve what I'm teaching. I want to make learning more engaging and interactive. And how do I do that? And then I know it's a good fit. So I sort of told you what I was doing, but it's hard uh, those words. <laughs> yeah, no, that was perfect. That was perfect. I mean, because I was imagining what you were doing with them in terms of um, the, the not not the pieces, not the strategy part, mm. but exactly what you do, what you bring to the table when you're working with the client. And mm. I love um, the way that you finished that story. Like you realize that, okay, this is, these are the kinds of people I need to be working with. I, the reason I, I come back to that is that when um, my friend Heather Younger was writing the book, The Art of Active Listening, which was released in April, fantastic mm-hmm. book. And um, last last year, March, I think, we were kind of brainstorming the names for this second book. It's actually her third book, but the second in a series. And the first book was The Art of Caring Leadership. And so her mm-hmm. publisher was like, it's probably going to be the art of whatever. So a group of us brainstorming different titles. And mm-hmm. these are all people with very different styles of creativity and, and thinking. I know because I have all their strengths finder results. Right. So. I knew who was in the room with us and we're kind of talking about it. And I said, yeah, there was a, a, a title thrown out there that was what I considered kind of touchy feely, kind of woo. Right. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, but the people who really need to read that, they're not going to read that with a title like that. Mm-hmm. And she said, here's the thing <laughs> you, um, you write to the people who are going to read it. You don't right. write to the audience that's not going to read it, no matter what the title is. Mm. You have to write. So I love that you preface the story with, I'm I may not be the right fit for you. Let's let's talk through this and make sure that you are the kind of curious um, organization that that wants that truly wants to integrate creativity and that you're not just saying it because it feels like the right thing to do. Right. And that's a, that's a big thing because oftentimes, you know, someone wants it, but maybe they're the only person that wants it and the rest of the organization doesn't want it. And there's a lot of resistance and that's a hard thing to manage. Absolutely. So you were saying that um, you really want to make sure you're a good fit because sometimes it's one person who thinks they want it, but there's not enough buy-in from uh, the rest of the organization. Tell me about a time that that happened and and kind of how that transpired? What was the solution if there was a solution? I don't know if it's actually happened because I'm very, I do a lot of data gathering up front to make sure it's the right fit and to make sure that I'm the right expert. I have a very, very specific niche um, on, on integrating creative thinking into the classroom. And so if it's not that, then I don't typically do it. And then I usually do a lot of upfront work to get the group acclimated to the kind of thinking that I would hope that they would want to bring. So I haven't had a situation in which I've walked in and the group was just totally closed off. And because, well, I shouldn't say that. Let me go back. I'm going to start that again. I've had several groups I've worked with that are sort of close to creativity, teacher groups, and they're close to creativity because they have this idea in their head that they're not creative. And the first thing I always say to teachers is, how many of you consider yourself creative? And usually half of them raise their hands. And then I say the, I ask the question, 
how many of you have had to solve a problem in the last week that you couldn't just Google the answer? And they all raised their hands. And I said, that's what teaching is. It's all problem solving. So if you think about creativity as problem solving and not just arts and crafts and who has a nice you know, door, then you'll understand that all of you in this classroom are creative. Otherwise, you wouldn't survive as a teacher. You just wouldn't. You can't survive as an educator if you're not thinking in different ways. And so I always frame it that way. But I also think that when I go into work with groups and they're a little bit hesitant like that, I do everything in my power to get them warmed up into a curious and playful and open-minded way. And I do that like usually, uh, I usually do that with appreciative inquiry. So I have them start by sharing experiences um, in the appreciative inquiry, which is designed by, it's a method designed by Cooper Ryder. Um, I have them describe a peak experience in teaching with a partner or a small group. And when people start talking about their peak experiences, they sort of shift their mindset into like, remind, like we're thinking about those wonderful moments they've had as educators. And it gets them into a different mindset. Like, hey, I got a lot of good stuff I'm doing. And then going into designing, like, so what is it that you want in the future? I want my students more engaged. I want less um, less chaos. I want more parent involvement or I want less parent involvement. You know, all those things that <laughs> you might want as an educator, like we, we sort of envision what a dream future would look like based on those strengths. And then you build from those strengths and you look at how to build a future that you really want. So- Appreciative inquiry is always great to bring into groups who are reluctant to move forward with something like creativity. I love that. And I asked that question because a few weeks ago, I interviewed two different women that work with, within uh, leadership and diversity inclusion training. Mm -hmm. And we talked about skeptics. Mm -hmm. And I think that especially in the creativity area, uh, we were talking about skeptics in DE&I, skeptics yep. in um, uh, leadership development, because they think they already know. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up for me was that um, I was struggling with a skeptic about StrengthsFinder. I think he was thinking it was kind of mumbo jumbo, woo woo uh, horoscopes. Mm -hmm. And my husband gave me this great line to open up with is, if Google can predict your behavior, what makes you think Gallup can't? Right. And that was, that has been kind of the icebreaker because mm. everybody laughs and then, mm. and then they think, oh yeah, maybe this is accurate because mm. we always have to start with, is it true? Is it accurate? Is this assessment of kind of how your brain works and how you process information and approach problem solving? Is it accurate? Because if it's not accurate, then we have nothing Right. To, to start with in terms of this assessment. But as soon as they agree that it's even somewhat accurate, then we have a place to go in terms of self-reflection, understanding where you really thrive and the areas that really drain you, mm -hmm. where you might be getting in your own way because your strengths are so natural and instinctive that sometimes you forget that other people don't think that way. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I asked that question. I love to talk about how we begin a conversation with people who might not be as open to it as we need them to be in order to be successful. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think talking about your peak experience, like if you, if you were to share your peak experience in coaching, you know, it would probably light you up and make you feel like, wow, I'm really good, you know, and you have that opportunity to share and mm -hmm. extracting the the pieces of that and the behaviors of that and why that happened and what were the circumstances, then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I, I actually can do this, you know, and you start to believe in yourself. And mm -hmm. I love that. It just, it changes the whole climate of the room. Like you just feel like this close, these closed off educators that sometimes I work with just open up and they just start mm -hmm. paying attention. Well, they start to remember why they're in it in the first place. Right. Oh, that's why I got into this. Th these yes. moments are the ones that I've forgotten to look for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I love that. Uh, there are a couple of things that stand out to me when you start an organ or start a meeting or, cause you could do this in every weekly meeting you have with your staff. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you start with something positive like that, where everybody's looking for something good that happened, even if yes. it was five years ago, you're looking for something good. And we know based on neuroscience, all the mm-hmm. research that's going on right now is that when you start like that, you're priming them to expect something good. Your mm-hmm. brain is, is ready. It's pumped. It's primed. Like you're giving it a little gas in the right direction to mm-hmm. say, now you can look for the next good thing. Right. And especially to celebrate those small wins along the way. If you look at Teresa Mobley's work, who is one of the creativity researchers in my field, um, who comes out of Harvard, she did a a book. She wrote a book called Progress Principle, and she talked about this, the very small steps you can have and celebrating those small steps. And she did look through dozens and dozens of journals from people who worked in organizations. And what she found was, you know, really appreciating those small wins and feeling like you're making some sort of progress, progress, even though it's small is beneficial. And I think so often we're just, especially like I have, I have two teenagers. We are running pretty much, you know, from the moment we step out of bed at six o'clock until we all collapse at 10 o'clock at night. And so sometimes it's hard to stop and go, okay, Hey, we made it through this week. You know, let's, Let's celebrate that. Like just right. finding those small things that we can celebrate in both our personal and professional lives, I think can really help with the overall well being that we're moving forward in something. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you and I can maybe give examples of how we've done that in our own lives. Because my first thought was when when we had teenagers at home, it's, we're empty nested now, but I remember one of the things that I really hold on to is being in the car together. Mm. So yes, they both had cars at some point, but we took a road trip um the year I think it was the year before my son graduated or right at the at spring break. It was one of the last spring breaks where we had both boys together. And um I realized that anytime we were in the car together, whether I was running errands with my older son and let him drive or running errands with the younger son, going out to dinner together all in the same car, which happens Mm. sometimes. Those were the moments that I would treasure sitting in the car with them because there's Mm. no other distraction. Right. And um, they would actually, before they'd take a call or answer a text, they would say, do you mind if I take this call if we were alone in the car together? Mm. And those are those moments that you, you have to notice because they go by so quickly And it's so much easier to notice the bad stuff, like when you got grumpy because you hadn't eaten all day. Right. And you're like, oh, I had such a shitty day, but that was 20 minutes. Mm. Right. What about, what about the drive to school where your kid actually kissed you goodbye? Mm. Oh, my son kissed me goodbye. He's in seventh grade. Wow. (laughs) Like own that. Yes. So what are your examples? All right. Would you say with my children or just in general? In general, I, I, I notice like, oh, our lilacs bloomed. Well, it's funny and that you every say time lilacs. I walk outside, right? Because uh, when I left my career in the academic world, which was um, about four years ago, I left a tenured position um, at SUNY Buffalo State. And I was there for 20 years and I could never keep a plant alive. Never. I had, I had so many plants over those 20 years. I could not keep a plant alive to save my life. So when I decided to go out on my own and start my own company. I got a plant and I said, I'm going to keep this plant alive. And then I got another plant. I said, I'm going to keep this, these two plants alive. Well, it's now like three or three and a half years later. And I have 70 plants in my house, inside of my house. And they're all doing very well. They are just my happy. It's like my happy spot. It forces me every day because having that many plants, I have to water different plants every day. I have like sections of my house that are watering the plants in this, in this room (laughs) and watering the plants in that room. And, and it's just so joyful to watch them grow. And I know during the pandemic, right before the pandemic hit, a teacher gave me a baby spider plant and I planted it right when the pandemic started. And then I took pictures of it and I sent it to her. I said, this is how long we've been in quarantine. This is how long we've been in quarantine. And it was all told through the story of the spider plant. And I just think it's an interesting way to think about growth and yourself. And uh, I have some friends who have started new positions and I give them a baby plant with a, a letter that says, 
this plant represents your well being. If you can't keep it alive, you're not doing something for yourself. And so if it dies, you need to really stop and reflect on what you're doing wrong that you can't even keep this plant alive because it only takes, you know, a little bit of watering once a week. So if you can't do that, then you're not taking good care of yourself. So I sent, I give that to sort of my mentees as they're starting out um, as a reminder that, you know, they, they might kill the plant. And I, and I write that in the, in the notes, which is, you know, if you kill this plant, which you probably will come back and I'll give you another one because you can start again, but I want you to reflect on whether or not this plant is getting what it needs and this plant represents you. So. Oh my gosh. What a gorgeous gift for somebody, mm. especially with that caveat, you, you, you're probably going to kill the plant. Probably going to kill and, it. That's okay. And my first thought was better to see the plant dead than to see you totally burned out. Yes. And so it's if very that easy to fall dead, into that. It is. If this plant is even, so I like peace lilies because they tell you when mm. they need attention, mm. you know, you know uh, within 24 hours, yes, they're all that your plant needs attention. Yep. Yeah. They get floppy. They get sad. And you can see that they look like they're sad. Mm. They don't look like they're dead. They don't even look like they're dying. They look like they're sad. Yeah. And um, I love that because when I think about your idea of giving it to them and saying it could die, but better it die than you, right? <laughs> like yeah. a little bit inside, you, a little bit of you is going to die inside every time you kill a plant <laughs> yeah. because you that means you're not taking care of you. Oh my gosh, yeah. that analogy is so perfect. Yeah. I, I also love plants because they sort of remind me of ideas. So you can have different kinds of ideas. I'm looking over at my, my windowsill right now, and I've got plants just all over my window. Um, and they're not all huge plants. Some of them are like little plants. And my husband gave me a plant of the month club because I, I became obsessed. So I get my little treat every month. But I think that like, like ideas, you know, you can have lots, they can, one can bridge off each other. Sometimes they die. Sometimes they last a short amount of time and it's just not the right environment for them. And they, you know, I just, one of my plants just just was like, I don't, I don't like living in this house and no matter what I did, it just wasn't the right fit. So I, you know, had to get rid of it or give it to someone else, or, you know, you can't have too many of the same, you know, ideas. You have to have a you know, diversity of ideas. And, and so it's just really interesting because I'm always relating my plants to creativity and how they, they get big. You can get them really, really big. If you give them a lot of attention, they can get bigger. You can share them with other people, um, or you can just keep it small and, and let them be what they are. And so it's just sort of analogy of life. That's why I love my plants. Oh, that's perfect. I I love analogies because they're they're so easy to play on and to mm. shift. Because my first thought was, yeah, you can have a really big plant that you're babying, you're taking care of, and for a while, you're not going to be able to pay attention to the other plants. No, you know, once this big plant gets big, oh my gosh, a thought just popped into my head that I have to share with you. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Little shop of horrors. Oh. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the plant shop and little shop of horrors, plant and flowers. And the reason that popped into my head as I was talking about the big plant kind of taking over is that we have a hops plant, two hops plants in our backyard. Mm-hmm. And when we were getting ready to leave for Italy, I did the twine across the shed that it climbs on because I knew that by the time we got back, it will be, it would have been falling over and killing Mm -hmm. off the plants that are planted in the raised bed under it because it grows fast and it takes over. So right before we left, it was, the shoots were roughly two to four inches tall. Mm -hmm. And when we got back, the tallest one was easily six feet up. Wow. And that's only two weeks. That's in two weeks. The thing about this is we call it Audrey too, which is the plant character so in Little Shop of Horrors <laughs> because it's hops, which means mm. for our listeners, hops have these big wide leaves. They almost look like pot leaves and they are sticky mm. and the stems, the vines are also sticky. They're like Velcro. 
So they stick to everything. And sometimes they'll go over our back door that we come in and out of, and they'll dangle over the door. And because I'm little, I'm only five foot two, I might not notice how long it's gotten and that it's come down into the door until I start to walk through and it grabs me. Mm, And because they're sticky, I actually, this is when she got her name, Audrey too. I was walking through. I didn't notice. It literally grabbed me right above the eyebrow and gave me a big scratch up the top of my head that was bleeding. Oh my gosh. Because it's so sticky and, and, and it's not necessarily sharp, but it's sticky enough that it, it gave me this scratch, this scratch across my forehead. So we named it Audrey too. And so now I'm thinking about this analogy, what you feed is what you're going to see grow. Right. And if you're only feeding this one idea, you, you may neglect the other ideas and that, that may be okay until it gets to a certain point, but you have to reassess is, is this really what I still want? Right. Because I'm neglecting these other ideas. Oh, right. This could go so many different different directions. I yeah. <laughs> love it. I know. It's fun to think about. It is. So tell me about something you're working on now, a story of, of something you're working on now that you're excited about. Well, I, I've always loved social media and I have uh, like 100,000 followers on Twitter. But since um, a certain person has taken over Twitter, it has not become a happy place for me. Like I, I actually end up frustrated every time I log in. And mostly because the things that are getting a lot of traction are sort of sad stories. And, you know, like mm-hmm. I, I logged on a couple of days ago and I was reading a story about a 14 year old who died. A mother was just sharing her story. And, and I, you know, I honor that. And I, I know people deal with grief in different ways, but where I was using it to help connect with educators, I didn't feel like it was doing that for me anymore. It was just all, all of a sudden, because I, I'm, I'm sensitive, like I'm reading the story about this 14 year old, I'm projecting my own daughter onto the story. I start getting teary eyed, mm-hmm. emotionally hijacked. And then I'm like, what am I doing? Like, what, why am I on this platform? Like, I didn't need to read that story. Like I, it wasn't a news story. It was just a woman sharing how, how grief stricken she is. And like I said, I honor that. And y- if you need that space, but every time I log on, it feels like there's either political craziness or people being really mean to each other. And I'm like, I wish there was just something that I could talk to educators about. So I had been in touch with a woman named Katie Trowbridge, who runs a nonprofit called Curiosity to Create. She's wonderful. You should interview her as well. Um, But (laughs) she runs a nonprofit. She's a former educator. And she contacted me and she said, Cindy, I love what you're doing. It's almost the same thing I'm doing. And she said, but I don't want to compete with you. I want to collaborate with you. So we started having these conversations around the time that Twitter started feeling like a a place that was um, toxic, that I just, I couldn't read tweets anymore because they were all just so negative. And and I'm not talking about stories about like sad stories, but just negative people just being very mean to me. I I just, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. It just feels horrible. And not the world I want to live in. I want to live in the Muppet world where we're all singing (laughs) together, not where we're just tearing each other down. So I, so we decided we were going to create a social platform for teachers. So we are about to launch on June 1st, the Creative Thinking Network for Teachers. And this is an online platform set up very much like Facebook. That's just for K through 12 teachers. And this is a place where they can talk to each other. They can share lesson plans. We have creativity infused lesson plans. We have creativity courses. We have monthly webinars. So everything that I wanted, I built with Katie and oh. we're launching it um, this week. Wow, Cindy, congratulations. And Thank for you. our listeners, this week is the week of May 25th. Fifth? Mm, yep. Yes. So we're okay. launching the network on June 1st. Okay. Launching the network on June 1st. Um, for our listeners, we will have a link mm. to get there um, so that you could check it out, especially if you're a K-12 teacher. But uh, more importantly, if you know K-12 teachers, uh, I know that many teachers are really, really struggling right now across the yes. country um, with banned books and weirdness about what they're allowed to teach and what they're not allowed to teach in the Yep. parenting. Holy cow. I'm glad my boys are out of school now. So we, we've been seeing a lot of ugliness in terms of parents not appreciating or respecting the teachers. And so we're losing a lot of teachers. 
So hearing that you have this new resource available to them just it really lights me up. I'm so glad to hear about this new project you're working on. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a lot of um, interesting work, challenging work. And I think, you know, just having a place and you know, we have a group of beta testers in right now and the beta testers are saying to us, you know, it, it just feels good to not have to read everything else. You know, like I can focus on teaching right. I, and, and we wanted to make it a space. In fact, one of our commercials is with a good friend of mine and she's a teacher and she talks about like, I just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. And I just feel like I want a friend to just listen. And, and that's what we want to create is a community of like-minded creative educators mm -hmm. who just want to be a support system for one another. And without all of the, you know, negativity that comes with other social media platforms, because that will not be tolerated. Yes. Um, like let's awesome. lift each other up instead of, you know, put people down or put things down or, oh, it's just, I find it exhausting sometimes because it's like in a, in a world of creativity and possibilities when we're just um, being negative and not looking at potential opportunities and changing things, it can be a really hard place to be stuck. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I, I think a lot about that and the fact that um, we we need each other and we need to support each other. Yes. So, yes, yes. Oh, that sounds like such a great platform. I can't wait to see where that goes and share it out with my teacher friends. Uh, that is really exciting. I love the idea of being able to be in that space and have that creativity and not have to scroll through other stuff that isn't relevant or is going to bring you down yeah. and, and still being able to talk to people without creating villains and victims. Right. Right. Let's, let's it. take a problem solving approach to this. And we have a course that we created called the core four, which is about core curiosity, open-mindedness, risk-taking and embracing challenges. So it's all about taking things from the core four attitude. Awesome. Perfect. Oh my gosh, Cindy, this has been such a treat. I am so grateful for that introduction by Caroline Brookfield. So thank you. Um, people that are listening right now, you have all of the links associated with this podcast episode in the podcast show notes at elkinsconsulting.com. Cindy, if you could leave this audience with one tidbit, one story that would inspire, what would that be? Not a story, but the one thing I always want people to walk away with is to just monitor their judgment and keep open to new ideas. Because when we start being, a, when, when we are aware of how we judge and when we judge, we can put the brakes on when we feel like we're judging too quickly. And so if you really want to live, for those of you who are listening, if you want to live a creative life, start watching when you judge things and especially how you judge yourself. Because so frequently when I'm working with people, the thing they judge the most is themselves. And when you say, I don't think I could ever do that. I think I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too, I don't have the funds for it. You know, really stop and say, why am I judging myself right now? And to really keep open to the ideas that you have and to the ideas of those around you. That is a great way to wrap this up. Thank you so much for joining me today, Cindy, on Thank your you stories don't define me. you, how you tell them will. Yes. Um, for our listeners, it's your turn now. What if you took this challenge from Cindy and the next time you found yourself judging yourself for something you do or don't do, or something you're afraid to do, or something you have an idea about and you should all over yourself about, I should be happy, or I should be okay with this without implementing this new idea I have. The next time you do that, really question where that came from. And just as importantly, maybe more importantly, find somebody who will support your idea or who will challenge you to think about your idea and how you could actually implement it. Mm -hmm. Find the people in your life, your community, that when you say, I have this crazy idea, they say, awesome, how can I help? Thank you for joining us. Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile if you just smile.